I was uh, invited by one famous retired professor here to come here and uh, share with you my thoughts about uh, hope in South Africa, maybe in Africa. But you forgot to tell me that the hall that we're going to use is a graveyard. <coughs> uh, Africans and graveyards don't quite <laughs> get on very well. <coughs> Before being sentenced to life in prison, Nelson Mandela expressed his hope, but not his fear when he said, and I quote, during my lifetime, I've dedicated myself to the struggle of the African people. I fought against white domination and I fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a free and democratic society in which all persons live together in peace and in harmony. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die." Unquote. After that world-famous quote, he was nevertheless sentenced to life imprisonment. Fortunately, not to death. Of course, he emerged 27 years later, a bit older, clearly more wiser, because before you, you are to be sentenced by a judge, you don't tell a judge that I'm prepared to die for whatever sentence. So. He was less wiser than, but when he came out of prison, he was more wiser. I'm sure he would not have said he was prepared to die. And between 1990 and 1994, there was a huge amount of violence that engulfed South Africa. Much of it orchestrated by what we called a third force. Unidentifiable people fanning violence across the townships of our country. And all looked gloomy. Everything looked like it was about to fall apart. But then hope kept us going. And in 1994, we were able to hold the first all-inclusive democratic elections. You'll all recall the long queues that characterized that election campaign of a people who not so long ago was subject to apartheid and subjugation but who kept the hope of freedom and peace. In 1994, I was appointed Minister of Labor. I knew nothing about labor matters. Uh, despite the misconception of many who, when they know that my name is Tito, they think, I probably derive my name from Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia, which I don't actually. My name comes from the Bible. You know, in the Bible, after Timothy is Titus. My actual name is Titus, actually. But because my community could not pro pronounce my name properly, I changed it to Tito. 
that was easier for them to pronounce. I suspect it's easier for many people. And the question that arose in 1994 when I became Minister of Labor was, what are you going to do for these millions of South African workers who for many years had lost hope and did not think that anything better would ever come for them. <clears throat> so I did four little things. One, to bring into being the basic conditions of employment for all workers, black and white. For the first time, black workers could say that in law, they have the basic conditions of employment. How many hours for work? How many hours for rest? How many weeks for holidays and so on? Things which <laughs> in a country like this you take for granted. But those workers had to have that. We brought in place a, La a Labor Relations Act, which, as you know, extends basic working rights, the right to organize, the right to strike, and many other rights. And for the first time, black South African workers could enjoy the same rights as all other workers in the country. And then because of the disaster system of Bantu education, we had to find an intervention mechanism which will improve the skills base of South African workers. Because as you know, in this country, without skills, no economy can function optimally. And so we introduced a skills development law, which imposed on every employer a levy for training, which we call the skills development levy. That goes in very well with your theme, hope, because with skills, we give working people hope that they'll be able to be productive, and produce goods of a higher quality. And for a period of time, we were still engulfed in major strikes and work disruptions. But the legal mechanism we had put in place began to stabilize the situation. And today, although we still experience strikes, that are much lesser in number and shorter in duration. We had never run a country before. We didn't know even where the restrooms were. But to try and find out all of this. And we found out that we had inherited a fiscal mess. The deficit before borrowing in the public accounts was in the region of 12% of GDP. The net open foreign currency position, basically the debt that we owed to the world, was $25 billion most of which, by the way, owed to private banks outside South Africa, which had entered into undercover arrangements with the South African Reserve Bank to provide these facilities, which ended up with this net open foreign currency position of $25 billion. It was a situation of hopelessness 
a bankrupt country, basically, to be governed by people who have never run a country, as they used to describe us, emerging from the bush, wearing jeans with uncut hair and unshaven. <clears throat> but we got down to business. And in a very short space of time, we brought hope back to our people. We reintegrated South Africa into the global economy. We rejoined the IMF and the World Bank, even though they're a bit difficult, those folks. We became full members of the United Nations. We signed trade agreements with many countries around the world. We rejoined the International Labour Organization. And suddenly, there was a spirit of enthusiasm that South Africa was now back to the world to contribute to a better situation. By 2009, the net open foreign currency position had been eliminated and the country had foreign exchange reserves of $50 billion. The budget was in surplus and inflation had come down to well below 10%, and interest rates came lower and became stable, and growth for the decade 1995 through to 2009 had averaged about 3.5%. And in the spirit of the theme of this conference, hope had been restored to our people. And today, South Africa faces more challenges. I have decided to give you a, an example of my village where I was born. The village is called Bordeaux, but the local people can't pronounce Bordeaux, they call it Bordeaux. Bordeaux in the local language is inside the black pot, the three pot, you see. Um, it gets its name, by the way, from the French Huguenot who came from here. Yeah. And they went to South Africa, and they acquired a farm there, and they called it Bordeaux. It reminded them of wine, I'm sure. So I grew up there. Uh, that village today is so different from the way it was when I was growing up. About 60% of young people who have passed metric are now graduates. About 80% of households have electricity. There's a clinic and there's a police station too. The only thing that's missing in that village is a waterborne sewage system. If you flew over that village at night in 1994, it was just dark. Today, when you fly over that village at night, you see light all over the place. It has become a place of hope. But within the context of this place of hope, are to be found many challenges. One of the biggest challenges that emerging countries such as South Africa face is around global economic governance. And in this regard, let me just mention the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. These institutions which are meant to, one, support development activities, reconstruction activities, provide fiscal support when it's necessary, particularly for 
emerging market countries, but not the only ones. There's something wrong with the way the IMF and the World Bank are governed. Fundamentally wrong. The G7 countries have decided amongst themselves that the head of the IMF will always be a European. And that the head of the World Bank will always be an American. I don't know any logic whatsoever which suggests that only Europeans and Americans have the necessary and sufficient capability to run this institution and nobody else. It doesn't follow even the logic of the bell curve. Now, one of the things that this conference can do to give hope to the emerging market countries is that we get into the streets and make the politicians in the G7 countries to change this old archaic formula so that we can indeed give hope to the rest of the world. Because of the way in which they have been treating us, a few of us have decided to get together and form a bank of our own, which we call the New Development Bank or the BRICS Bank. I am a director in that bank on behalf of South Africa. And we pledge that we're going to do things differently and faster. For example, we do not provide policy prescriptions to any of the countries which borrow from us. It is their business to sort out their policy prescriptions. They must sort themselves out. They must just repay us our money. That's what we're interested in. Of course, principal with interest. We have already approved five projects, all renewable energy projects, within one year. Something which would have taken the IMF, I mean the World Bank rather, over a year to put in place. So there we are, creating our own basis of hope for emerging market countries. And I think given the caliber of people in this hall, we have many friends amongst you to join us in changing the world for the better. I thank you very much, and I wish you great hope.